morning, everybody. I want to start over in Matthew chapter 6, scripture that um, I find myself going to quite often, just as a reminder of certain aspects of, of this life and keeping things in perspective. I want to start in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. And this is when Jesus was giving a sermon. So, boy, it would be great if it would be great to hear a sermon from Jesus Christ. Well, anything, if you have a red letter Bible, anything in the red letter is basically a sermon from Jesus Christ. So this is Jesus giving a message, and he says, in relation to stress and anxiety. Now, before I read this, you know, I don't know, maybe this isn't pertinent to anybody here. Is anybody stressed out? I get a lot of nods, yes. This life can be stressful, can't it? There's many things that could cause us stress, and they do. I mean, we've, John just talked about the prayer requests. The things that we deal with in this life certainly cause us stress. You look at the news. I mean, I'm just looking at the news this past week. Again, you see all these riots in Baltimore. You see that, you know, regardless of what um, might have been unjust or some injustices, it's just a terrible thing to see people breaking into stores, setting things on fire, looting. You know, this world has a way of continually reminding us of, of the evil in the world and um, the, the suffering that takes place. And Jesus says here, because these things stress us out, he says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Now that's a tough one, because we love our lives. In fact, probably one of the most stressful things that we can deal with in this life, and many of us have dealt with it, some of us are dealing with it now. If we're not dealing with it now, rest assured, we will deal with it at some point is the fact that this life is temporary. We love our lives. And Jesus says, don't worry about your life. Wow, he kind of gets right into it. He says, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. So don't worry, you know, we're all, we always go shopping and we're worried about the clothes we wear. I think depending on the situation you are in your life, these words can take on completely different meanings. Imagine being in a concentration camp in Germany reading these few sentences. Take no thought for your life. It says, it is not the, li it is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment. Behold, or the fowls of the air. So Jesus, I imagine him speaking in front of a crowd, pointing to some birds that are probably flying overhead. He says, look, look at the, the, the birds in the air. He says, they don't worry about this stuff. They're not farming, they're not sowing, they're not, you know, tilling the ground. Neither do they reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Somehow, there's still birds here. They stay alive. God takes care of them. Jesus says in other scriptures that it's through him that all of life is sustained. That this whole creation is sustained. So there's a lot of truth to this. The reason why the birds continue to live today is because God's taking care of them. He's protecting the, this balance of life. We've talked about this principle, this anthropic principle, that, that so many things have to be perfect in this existence for life even to exist, that it's, it's tenuous. And God holds it all together. And then he says here, aren't you not much better than they? Aren't you so much more important to God than the birds? 
He said, which of you, by taking thought, and the point is, by worrying, by stressing, and we do this, these, we worry a lot, stresses, you know, the, they, they churn through our minds. It's like a tape recorder. We keep playing these things over and over in our minds as if thinking about it is going to somehow change it. And Jesus says, which one of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And the point is, we can't, but God can, if he so chooses. And why take you thought for clothing or raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory, one of the richest men who've ever lived, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Again, pointing to the fact that God takes care of his creation. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, in other words, that it's only temporary, shall he not much more clothe you, O of little faith? God will take care of you, is what he's saying. Now, he says again, therefore, don't stress out. Take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Put the kingdom of God first. And this isn't, if we take this literally, he's saying, get your mind on the kingdom of God. Now, where is the kingdom of God? Is the kingdom of God here in this world? There are some people believe that it is, but we know from the scripture that the kingdom of God is not here yet. And thank God, because if this is the kingdom of God, it's not that wonderful, is it? <laughs> No, we know that there is a kingdom coming. Jesus Christ is coming back as a king, and he's going to set up a kingdom, and this world is going to be very different then. So he says, put your mind on that, on the kingdom of God, and his righteousness. And if we do that, he promises here, all these things will be added unto us. Now, does that mean that we're not going to suffer in this life? Does that mean that he's going to take away all of the stresses or the things that cause stress in this life? Absolutely not. See, the thing is, when you're putting your mind on the future, on the kingdom, it helps us to deal with all this, the stress of this life knowing that it's temporary. So Jesus tells us, don't stress out in this life. Much easier said than done. I kind of picture sometimes thinking to myself, all right, well, I stress a lot. I'm, you know, I'll, I'll confess there's a lot of things that I stress about, so I fail in taking his advice often. And so I picture myself someday standing before Christ and he's listing all these things that happened to me in this life and he's saying, in all these things, you didn't put the kingdom first. You stressed out. You wrung your hands. You churned over these things. And I'm going to say, you mean you were serious about that? You mean you really wanted me not to stress? And I can conclude from this that he's going to say, yeah. Yeah, that's what I expect of my people. That their faith is so strong and that they stay so, stay so focused on the kingdom that the things that this life throws at us don't stress us out. Again, easier said than done, especially if we're in the midst of a trial. Especially if we're in the midst of a trial. Over in John chapter 15, Jesus tells us, John chapter 15, verse 11, 
that, and he references in other areas that, you know, he was praying in John chapter 16 through 18 that he didn't want us to be taken out of the world. No, he wants us to be in this world. But God, but he prayed that the Father would strengthen us in it. And he says here in verse 11 of chapter 15 of John, these things, in other words, the things that he shared with us, his beautiful truth, his commandments, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you, that Jesus Christ's joy would be in us, and that your joy might be full. So even in the midst of this imperfect world with all the suffering around us and the suffering that we go through, Jesus Christ wants our joy to be full. He wants us to be joyful. Again, easier said than done. I find myself more and more turning back to the book of Genesis, going back to the first three chapters of Genesis, and I, I'm amazed at how much truth and knowledge and insight is right here in these first few verses. So I'm going to go back to verse chapter 3 of Genesis just to remind us about this world, that God never... Well, I won't say that, because when God created the world, it was perfect, but then it got broke. And this current world that we're in is not perfect. It's not. So why should we stress out when we realize that it's not perfect? When we see riots, when we see terrorism, when we see disease, when we see death, God told us that this is the the signature of this world. Look over here in chapter 3 of Genesis. We'll start here in let me just catch my place here. Verse 16. So this was after Adam and Eve had sinned. And God was going to tell them, now that you've sinned, this is what life in this world is going to be like. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. So, there you go. There's going to be sorrow in this current world. In sorrow you shall bring forth children, and your desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. And unto Adam he said, because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife and have eaten the tr of the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow shall you eat all the days of your life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face shall you eat bread till, the, till you return unto the ground. In other words, God told them, if you eat of this, you're going to die. Death is going to be a mark of this world. For out of it were you taken, for dust you are, and unto dust shall you return. So that is the lot of this world. Thorns and thistles, sorrow, death. Expect it. It's the world we live in. So there are people now that recognize the sorrow of this world and they turn to man. They think that if we just get the right president, if we just get a, a Democrat in the office, or a Republican in the office, or, or maybe a more conservative one, or a more liberal one, or whatever it is, or if the United States would just go and, and have this foreign policy, things would get better. We can do it. We can fix this. Look over here in Isaiah chapter 31. There's a scripture here that I look to, and it's so revealing. Isaiah chapter 31. Verse 
verses 1. We'll just start reading in verse 1 here. Isaiah chapter 31. I'll give you a second to get there. So for all of us who look to man to find peace or to find solutions, to find the next cure for this disease, to wipe out cancer or whatever it is, those of us who look toward man, woe to them, woe to them, that go down to Egypt, chapter 31 of Isaiah, verse 1, for help. In other words, Egypt referencing, remember we, God took Israel out of Egypt? Egypt references this world, mankind, man. Woe to them that go and stick, um, to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots, trust in man's inventions. Because they are many. There's many inventions. There's many people out there that are claiming to have the solutions. And in horsemen, because they are very strong, there's great innovations out there. Medical sciences had great breakthroughs. Certainly we can trust in it. He says, woe to them that put their trust in these things. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel. They don't look to God for their salvation, for their healing. Neither seek the Lord. Yet he also is wise, Man claims to have the answers, claims to be wise, and will bring evil, and will not call back his words, but will arise against the house of the evildoers. So, so God's saying that he's going to arise some day against all of those that don't seek him, those that don't keep his commands, and against the help of them that work iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men. They're men and not God, and their horse is flesh, and not spirit. When the Lord shall stretch out his hand, both he that helps shall fall. In other words, even those men that are doing good are going to die. They're going to fall. Both he that helps shall fall, and he that is helped shall fall down, and they all shall fail Together. In other words, mankind will fail. It's a very profound scripture. God's telling us don't put trust in man and don't put trust in this world because this world is meant to be broken, it's meant to be temporary. Now, we're in an interesting time in the Holy Day season. So the Holy Days have a lot of overlap. When I think of the Feast of Weeks, so we call it Pentecost, and I almost think it's unfortunate that it's called Pentecost because the only meaning in Pentecost is 50. It's 50 days after that first Sabbath of, of the Passover and the Passover season. But in the Old Testament, it wasn't called Pentecost. It was called the two things, the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of First Fruits. That has meaning. Now, what is the Feast of Weeks? Weeks are finite. So it starts at the Passover, which represents our rebirth, the conception, our con commitment to Christ, the receiving the Holy Spirit when we commit to him through baptism, going under the waters of baptism, putting to death the old man, coming up out of the water, a new person. And then there's seven weeks, and at the end of that seven weeks, it's finite. There's a point in time, the feast of first fruits. There's a harvest, where God's going to harvest his first fruits, those that are his at his coming talking about the resurrection, the first resurrection. Now, going back to the Feast of Weeks, this temporary time frame, our lives 
are temporary, aren't they? We just read it in Genesis. Dust you are, dust you shall return. In Hebrews, we are told that it's given to every man once to die. And then the resurrection. Part of our lot in this life is that we will all pass through that experience. We read in, I think it's either Thessalonians, I think it's Thessalonians where it says there's a mystery. Some of us at Christ's return will be changed at the last trump in a twinkling of an eye. So not all of us are going to sleep. Whoever is alive at his coming will just be changed. But the point is, even if we fall asleep, the Bible tells us that the dead know nothing. There's no worship of God in the grave. It's like going under when you're going through surgery. I don't know if any of you have ever been through surgery. You, you go under, and then I'll, I, I had it happen to me one time. It was at the dentist. I remember they were counting one, two, three, and then all of a sudden, the next moment I can imagine, it felt like four. It felt like the next second. All of a sudden, I had all this cut in my mouth. I don't know how many hours passed, but it was like a twinkling of an eye. So we're told that all of us are going to go through that temporary time frame, and these Feast of Weeks remind, reminds us that this world is temporary. James tells us and refers to this life as a vapor that appears for a little time, then vanishes away. A vapor, like a little a cloud that you can see for a little bit, and all of a sudden it just disperses and goes away. Turn with me over to First, or First Chronicles chapter 29. Look at this, First Chronicles. All the way back in the Old Testament, after the book of Kings, First Chronicles. We don't actually go to Chronicles quite often, but there's a lot of really profound truth in the book of Chronicles. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 15. And this is where the Feast of Weeks, to me, connects with the Feast of Tabernacles. It says, For we are strangers before you, and sojourners, as were all our fathers. Our days on the earth are as a shadow, and there is none abiding. Our days are as a shadow. If we read about the Feast of Tabernacles, it talks about the fact that we are tab tabernacling here in the flesh. Jesus Christ's life on this earth was just temporary. He tabernacled here in the flesh. Even this world, if you think about it, is tabernacling. Look over in 2 Peter chapter 3. Because those of us who love this physical, I mean, I love this world. It's springtime, everything's blossoming. There's flowers on the trees, beautiful Cleveland pear trees that we have in this region, just balls of white blossoms. I've been able to, you know, the weather's been nice here in Cleveland. It's been a long time coming, but it's been nice this past week. Had an opportunity to sit on the back patio a couple times. It's beautiful, and we connect to it, but God says don't get too connected because it's only temporary. Even this world is temporary. Look over here in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements the dirt, the earth, shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, wow, this earth, God tells us at some point in the future it's going to be dissolved, burned up. 
And then he says, seeing that all this is going to be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be? So remember, Jesus told us about anxiety. Put your mind on the kingdom, not on the earth. Put your mind on your resurrection, not on our physical life today, knowing that it's just temporary. Even the earth is temporary. So, again, easier said than done about anxiety. I want to share an experience that I had. I try to think of something in my life that, uh, you know, you're probably not going to think it was that bad. I know that a lot of us are going through some very serious trials in our life. So I'm not, I don't want to compare anything, but I was thinking back. For me personally, there was about four hours of my life that were pretty miserable. Pretty miserable. So I was in boot camp, and I had missed by one week. So if I would have went to boot camp one week later, I would have got issued winter gear, which would have been a nice, heavy winter jacket. I wasn't is issued winter gear because it was one week earlier, it was summertime. Now, in Paris Island, it got really, really cold that year, around the end of September, early October. And right at the end, right during that time frame, I was in the rifle range. And we spent, you know, from 7 a.m. till about 7 p.m., we were outside shooting our, our rifles. And it was one of those days, it was around 38 degrees, so just above freezing, and raining. And none of us had any jackets. We just had our utility and our camouflage. Not even a windbreaker. And we were, I remember laying down, shooting my rifle, laying in the ground that was soaking wet with this 38 degrees freezing rain. It wasn't even freezing, it was just cold. It was cold to the bone. Cold to the bone. Now, compared to a lot of things, that's not that bad. But for me, at that moment, I can remember it like yesterday. It was miserable, shivering, cold. And this gun that was making a lot of noise and recoil and, you know, your hands are freezing. I didn't have any gloves. It was miserable. But I knew that around 8 or 9 that night, I'd be able to go back to the barracks and take a warm shower. And I knew there was a warm bed waiting for me. It wasn't this great fancy bed. It was just a bunk bed. But I'll tell you, I remember thinking, I just got to get through this because if I can get, just get to that warm shower, I'll get warm. See, the hope of that warm shower in that bed, the hope... And the vision of, of that helped me get through that. And sometimes in life, you don't realize how much you can bear. You can get through it. People, I, I saw this story of the Holocaust about two weeks ago. People are telling about their experience. And it was about this group of people that actually escaped from a prison camp. About 200 Jews actually escaped. And they were sharing their story. And they were telling the things that they endured, the horrors that they went through, but they endured it. And I remember after that warm shower and the chill was gone out of my bones and I was laying in my bed, nice and cozy, it wasn't so bad. It wasn't so miserable. In fact, it made that bed feel all the more better. It was wonderful. That was one of the best night's sleep I think I ever had in my life. I remember my grandpa, Mike, my dad's father, 70 years old, and all the grandkids were sitting around the back porch, and he was telling us how when he was 18 years old, he was actually a hobo for a while. He lived on trains. He, didn't, he slept outside. 
And he said he went through a winter and he went to a shelter one day and he had clean sheets and a warm bed. And he told us that story and he says that was one of the best experiences of his life. He said he couldn't imagine how welcome and how grateful he would be just to have a clean sheet and a warm bed. It's kind of what I felt like that night. And the point, the reason I brought up that story is because hope can be a powerful thing to get us through the most difficult trials in this flawed and broken world that we live in. This temporary world Temporary, realizing that it's just temporary, is a blessing. Knowing, imagine if we were sick and we were going to live for a thousand years with that sickness. <laughs> Glory to God that he doesn't allow that to happen, that he has made this imperfect and broken world temporary. Look over here in Isaiah chapter 51. God tells us, don't worry about this world. Isaiah chapter 51. Start in verse 7. Hearken unto me. God said, hey, let me have your attention. Hearken unto me. Listen to me. You that know righteousness, my people. The people in whose heart is my law, fear you not. Fear you not the reproach of men. Neither be you afraid of their revilings. So don't be afraid of the things that this life throws at us. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wood, but my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. In other words, God's promise of salvation to us, the hope of that nice warm bed, which is the kingdom. Look in the verse here, in uh, verse 11. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord, those of you who have been baptized, your, God's people, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. So sometimes we look for healing in this lifetime. Sometimes God's merciful and gives us healing in this lifetime. But even then, even if God heals us, there's still a time in the future in this life where we're going to have to deal with sorrow. So what this is saying is that there's a time in the future. It's just a matter of timing. God does promise salvation. He does promise healing. It's just a matter of timing, brethren. It's just a matter of timing. He says, Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Sorrow and mourning shall flee away. I, even I, am he that comforts you. God comforts us. Who are you? that you should be afraid of a man that shall die and of the Son of Man which shall be made as grass. Drop down to verse 15. But I am the Lord your God that divided the sea. In other words, now God's talking about his power. I am the Lord of that God that divides the sea, whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is his name. Think of the salvation he gave to the Israelites when he departed that sea. And I have put my words in your mouth, and I have covered you in the shadow of my hand. Remember, we read in Isaiah that this life is just but a shadow. 
Now God is saying that his shadow is covering us. That I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth and say unto Zion, you are my people. God wants us to know that he's got our backs and that his promise of salvation is sure. So that alone it should give us comfort. The fact that, like the Feast of Weeks, realizing that all of this is just temporary and that it wasn't meant to be perfect in this world, that God and Christ puts us in it but will strengthen us in it, but gives us hope. So that hope should help us not to have the stress and anxiety that other people have. Peace of mind. But brethren, there is so much more, so much more that we can get excited about when we think about the resurrection and the Feast of first fruits. So much more. So I want to share, I talked about this a little bit when we were at the feast, we had an opportunity to go to Disney World um, before the feast. And um, Disney World's a cool place. How many of you have had a ch chance to, to go to Disney World or Disneyland? Actually, most of you. OK, how many of you have seen any Disney movies? How many know the stories of Peter Pan and some of the fantasy of Disney? So I, I share this experience. We were watching this. Um, show right when you walk in and my mom and dad had you know were there with me and um you know i thought that it would be great for the kids and they they had the dancing with cinderella came out and peter pan came flying up over the castle and they were singing and everything else and i remember looking and i saw and i don't know if i i think i saw it in my dad's eyes too but definitely in my mom's eyes little tears coming down so something happened to my mom and dad when they saw Disney. I think that it reminded them of their childhood, their youth, their youth. You see, I think about, I think that's what Disney's selling and why it's so famous and popular is it's, they're selling childhood, they're selling youth. Isn't youth wonderful? Think of the day in your life when you felt great. You felt healthy. You ever have those days where you just wake up and your body just feels great? It's been a while since I felt like that. I felt like that a lot as a kid. In fact, most of my childhood, I woke up feeling great. Not a care in the world. Mortality is like the furthest thing from your mind. Think of that feeling, that youth. I think that's why Disney is so attractive. And then the fantasy. Couple that with the ability to, like Peter Pan, to just think and fly. Now, I ha I've had this reoccurring dream. I might have shared it with you before. But I've had this dream. And I still have this dream. I've had it since I can remember. As an early child where I can just concentrate. I can concentrate, and all of a sudden, I start to levitate. I, and I get up, and I'm like levitating, and I'm hovering over the trees, and I, I'm looking down at my house in Winchester Court where I grew up, and I'm levitating, and I'm flying, and all of a sudden, I get distracted. All of a sudden, I start stressing about something, and I start to fall, and I gotta concentrate. And then I start to levitate again. And for me, we've had dreams that you kind of know you're dreaming. This is one of those dreams that you swear is real. Like, I wake up and I go, wow, I thought that was real. And then I'm like, sometimes, like, when I'm not dreaming, I try to concentrate to see if I can fly. I don't know, I'm just <laughs> sharing that with you. Like, maybe God gave me, maybe there's this power in me. They, you know, they say you're only using about 10% of your brain. Maybe if I could just use 20% and I concentrate real hard, maybe I'll be able to, like, fly. 
Now, I read about miracles where Jesus Christ, after he was resurrected, appeared in a room multiple times. And I can read at the end of Matthew and Luke when Jesus was with his disciples and all of a sudden, Jesus flew. He just right up into the clouds. And it, there's a story that the apostles were like, probably with their jaws dropped. And there's an angel that appeared next to him and said, why do you marvel at this? He's going to return the same way. Now I wonder if that dream, I don't know how many of you have had dreams where you can fly. A few. I wonder if God programmed that in us for a purpose, because there's some reality to it. I mean, I know that there's reality to it because I have a scripture that tells me that Jesus Christ could fly like Peter Pan as a spirit. We went into this little thing in Disney where it was like the Star Wars it was this, um, this little room that was on hydraulics, and it was a 3D, it went in with your 3D glasses, and it had the, you know, you're taking off and you're flying through space, and then you hit warp drive, and phew, we were on the other side of the galaxy, and then we slow down, and we're flying around all through space. And I asked the kids, they said that was their favorite ride at Disney. And it was 3D, and it was real, and it was like you're just literally flying and zooming through space. Now, Jesus Christ tells us that he has inherited the universe. And that he's going to scroll up, the, wind up the universe like a scroll. We read in Job that he stretched out the heavens. Jesus Christ has power. He created the universe. He can certainly fly around it and zoom through it. You ever wonder why these fantasy movies are so popular? Because I think it connects with us in a way that God programmed us to connect with. That vision of what it's going to be like to be a spirit being, imagine that feeling of when you felt so healthy and vibrant as a kid. Do you think you're going to feel healthy when you're spirit? The energy that you're going to have? Knowing that you're never going to die? And the ability to just fly you know, around and travel through space? It's incredible if you think about it. Look over here, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I referenced this. I want to go through just a few more scriptures here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Very fitting as we start thinking about this Feast of Weeks that we're in right now and what it's going to be culminating here in the day of Pentecost, the, the first fruits. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, in other words, as we're physical, which we are now, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Talking about the fact that we are going to take on spiritual bodies. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. So here's where it is. I was wrong. It wasn't in Thessalonians. It was here in 1 Corinthians. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed. Whether we die or whether we're alive at the resurrection, those of us who are Christ are going to be changed from physical to something else. He says, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, 
at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and we're talking about when Christ returns, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible or physical body, this corruptible world, this corruptible must put on incorruption. It has to. That's God's plan. God will not tolerate the existence of, an in, or of a corrupt world. He's going to change it. We read in 2 Peter how he's, this is all going to be consumed. He's going to replace it with the perfect world. It says this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal, this physical existence we're in that is temporary must put on immortality, a spirit body. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on in immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that, that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? We can read in Luke chapter 12 how we are not to fear those who can kill our body, but fear him that has power over the second death. You can look in Revelation chapter 20. The second death is basically Gehenna fire, where all of those that are in, incorrigible, who will never yield to God's will and his commands, are ultimately going to end up being burned up. That's the second death. That's what we should fear is that second death, brethren. But we look to that resurrection, that hope, I want to just go through a, a couple calculations here because I want to share. Thinking about this universe, we can read about how in Romans chapter 8, we are joint heirs with Christ. You say, what has Christ inherited? He's inherited the universe. All the stars, everything in it. Now, I did some calculations. And they say that the observable universe is about a trillion stars, or about, about 100 billion galaxies. 100 billion galaxies. That's not that much. That's not even close to our national debt. <laughs> you think of 100 billion. That's a lot. 100 billion galaxies. Now, in each galaxy... There's about 400 billion stars. Okay, so now you start thinking, all right, there's about 10 with 24 zeros after it stars, or septillion. So Michael and I looked up all the, you know, what is it with 90 zeros? And we looked up all this. But septillion is 10 with 24 zeros after it. So there's about septillion stars in the observable universe. Now I thought, okay, let's look at how many people have ever lived. And I was looking at, okay, between the flood and now, there's about 7 billion people today, and it's interesting, there wasn't that many people before. It's, it's like the population is doing one of these. So if you take the 7 billion today and then everyone else who's ever lived, it's probably like 8 or 9 billion. What I didn't realize is before the flood, there are estimates that there was between 9 billion, or some, some have done calculations with the fact that people lived back then to be hundreds of years old, you know, six, seven hundred years old. So people weren't dying out. If they factor that in, before the flood, some experts say that there could have been upwards of 140 billion people. There's seven billion today, 140 billion people that lived before the flood. Talk about temporariness. God wiped them out, started over. So if we just take conservatively 100 billion people, that's 10 with 11 zeros after it. So if I take 10 to the 24 stars divided by all the people that have ever lived, that comes to about 
10 trillion stars per person that's ever lived. So just imagine if every person who's ever lived is transformed to a spirit being and God says, all right, there you go, here's the universe, co-heirs. I inherited the universe. Terry, Beth, Rick, go take your lot. You each get 10 trillion stars to play around in. That's about 10 galaxies, 10 different Milky Way galaxies. You think of God as a creative being. You start wondering what God is going to let us do. The fact that in him is the ability to create. Is it a stretch to think that God might want us as spirit beings to go create? You start getting your mind around what God has in store for us, brethren. I have to jump through a couple scriptures here real quickly. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4. A couple scriptures and then we'll wrap it up. 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter, Peter chapter 4. I remember in Matthew, Jesus said that we are to endure trials and not to be stressed out. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Peter says, Behold, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, in other words, the things that we deal with in this life, as though some strange thing happened unto you. In other words, it happens to everybody. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Exceeding joy, brethren. The Bible says, I has not seen nor ear heard what God has in store for us. It's almost impossible to imagine the glory that we're going to have and the power and the strength and the joy. So I think in this little tiny thing that happened to me in boot camp of this misery of being bone chilling cold, thinking of how just thinking of a warm bed could get me through that. How much more, brethren, thinking of the resurrection and the great promises God has for you of true healing, true healing, not just of our bodies, but of the world. A world of peace and of love, of no disease, no sickness. And you being a dynamo of power and life to be able to have a universe at your fingertips that God's going to give you as an inheritance, sharing it with you, for you to go and just have exceeding joy to be able to share that and spend eternity, eternity with your loved ones. Maybe some of whom you've already had to say goodbye to in this life, who are now sleeping, awaiting the resurrection. If we just look to the future and keep that hope, brethren, as Jesus tells us, put first in your mind the kingdom of God. That's what he's talking about, the kingdom of God. Next to that vision, realizing that this life is just temporary and it wasn't meant to be anything else. It helps us deal with the sufferings and the injustices we see in this life. So this Feast of Weeks is meant to help us understand that we are finite. 
in this world, in these tabernacles. Reference Philippians, brethren, where the Apostle Paul just said, in light of all of this hope, he continues to press toward the mark. And that's what I would encourage, encourage all of us to do. Press toward the mark, brethren. Continue to keep that vision of the future. We're told to be joyful and to rejoice even in the midst of this evil world that we're in. There is troubles around us, brethren, but God's promises are referred to as exceeding great and precious promises. And these are real promises, and God has the power to deliver it. And he is merciful and just, and his word stands. He will do it. I think of Disney and my own personal, I don't want to call it a fantasy because Jesus says through him all things are possible and it's true. I said at the feast, I would love to be a superhero, to be able to fly for real. And if I can get my mind around it and realize that's exactly what my Bible tells me, that's the promise. I'll be able to fly around the universe like that little ride that we went through at Disney. One of Disney's famous quotes is, if you can dream it, you can achieve it. I wonder if God inspired him to think that way or to have that quote. If you can dream it, you can achieve it. Well, brethren, in light of what God promises, I can't imagine what I can't dream as long as it's righteous that God won't give us. It's an amazing, amazing truth, brethren. That hope should help us to put everything in perspective. If we can really get our minds around that vision, then we can do what Jesus told us to do in Matthew chapter 7. Don't stress. Put your mind on the kingdom first. And God will give us all these other things.